Hello, everyone. I am so thrilled that you're all with us today. What a joy it is to be able to come together. And in the words of someone very special in my life uh, that was part of our first broadcast way back about 12 years ago, Hello World. <laughs> I'm hoping we'll have people from around the world today. We did had a couple of them last time, mostly from the United States, from Canada, but certainly from all over this country. And now, of course, uh, Colorado is going to be uh, another hot spot. <laughs> and ultimately, I hope Kansas City will be because a lot of my friends from years past live here in Kansas City and and we'll have some of them on in future calls. Uh, I'm loving being here. It's a wonderful gift. I'm loving working with Ross and Mary and they are wonderful gifts in my life. And so I will always want to start with the invocation. And so let's start with that now. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon us. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your power. Speak through us. Let us reveal your will and your work through our words and through our lives. Let this call be dedicated to that will, to that work, to that love, that is called by Love Institute. Come Holy Spirit. And so it is. Amen. Amen. And Ross, I'm going to turn it over to you because this month you're going to uh, be the one asking the questions or giving the prompts or... <laughs> wondering a role that I often play. And we're going to be talking about my life. <laughs> well, yes, Marge. So thank you very much. And we're going to be talking about your life and of course, a larger context of all of our lives and, <clears throat> and how all of our lives unfold. And so for the folks on this call or that might be uh, listening to it uh, in a recorded version, Basically, our theme for today is the river of the soul, the soul's journey uh, throughout a life where the soul has a plan and it has a destiny. It has a purpose that is being progressively revealed. And Marge has broken this down, uh, this beautiful play of the soul into four acts, which we're going to talk about. And um, she's going to illustrate that uh, with in the microcosm of her life with some pictures and stories. And we've already have some themes that have, uh, have emerged that emerge uh, in our individual soul's journey and in our collective soul's journey. One of those themes that we might be uh, exploring is the theme of holy wounds, um, the fact that things happen in our life uh, oftentimes that are traumatic or wound us, but that that has a purpose in the growth and the evolution of the soul. We're also going to be looking for uh, synchronicity, which is the arrival of things from unexpected places and unexpected dimensions that change the path of life in ways that the personal mind cannot predict or control, and how those synchronicities you know, change our direction and our destiny. Um, we may also be talking a little bit about communication through the veils, which is uh, Marge's term for a kind of a multidimensional communication that happens where the soul becomes guided by voices and by channels and by dreams um, that occur in a nonlinear way. And then also just one of the skills about the soul's journey, which is the openness to it and the surrender to it and the curiosity about where a soul might go. 
So if we get to all those things in one hour, we'll have done an awful lot. But so, Marge, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, maybe you could just begin and tell us a little bit about uh, your kind of orienting generalization uh, of the four acts of life. Well, this is something that is still emerging for me. I am in my 80s now. Uh, I will turn 85 on my next birthday. And, and, you know, I've never lived these years before. There's no way I can look back on them because they are still in my emerging profile. And that would be, a uh, profile would be another way to express my emerging God's plan. <laughs> what I know clearly in my life is that I have been called by God. And I've begun to define it in four acts, four acts in a divine play. And I think it's probably many more because I think we're dealing with multiple lifetimes. Uh, and I'm beginning to be uh, more and more clear about that as I've done the training with Suzanne Giesman um, on communication through the veils and hearing through the veils from people I have loved, including my son, my mother, my birth father. That is a whole kind of new experience. This is not something I taught from the platform as a minister for over 30 years. It's it seemed way too far out. And now I am <laughs> becoming a radical revolutionary in the vastest sense of the word and loving the way far out. And actually, I'm experiencing it in a way I could have never anticipated because it involved death again. I've had a lot of people die in my life that I've deeply loved, including my son, including my beloved from my teenage years, including uh, my brother, uh, my mother and father, of course, my father when I was only 11. Um, but in the four acts of life, I've begun to divide them into 25 year cycles. This is brand new for me. Charles Fort Billmore used 10 year used seven year cycles. And in my book, Your Soul's Invisible Clo Codes, uh, that's the cycle I suggest you work with. I've often taught it because it simply speeded it up in decades. What I realize now is that the 10 year cycles are soul's decades. And so there's a kind of in between this. 25 year awareness that combines above and below that includes um, the last 25 years of my life from 75 to 100 and beyond. So it goes into timelessness. It, so the four pictures I chose to send to you are representative of different stages in my life. And Marla, <laughs> she's on the call today, Marla was Bud's beloved. And so Marla and I have known each other since the early 2000s at Unity in Tustin. She worked for, for the church and for me and, and fell in love with my son and he with her, the only woman he ever really loved. It's really important in my life to have, still have Marla with me. And uh, she guessed that one of those pictures was probably at in Walnut Creek. The last picture that she said was a little hard to see. Actually, it was this one. That Actually, that was Unity of Tustin. I'll talk more about that later. But let me go to the first picture, that, which is part of my first act. And in the email we sent you, I took a photograph of this frame. It's been sitting on my desk in my office at Unity in Tustin, in my office at Unity in Walnut Creek, because I know the imprints of your childhood are extremely important. I began to get curious about how old I was in that picture, only as I prepared for this call. 
And I thought, oh, well, it, I'm sure it's in my baby book. It wasn't. I was shocked. And I looked to see the last picture that was posted in my younger years. And it was when I was seven years old, eight years old. And I, what happened? Well, what happened was that my father died when I was 11 and my mother ran away. <laughs> a pattern that I've adopted into my own life of running away from grief, running away from not knowing what to do next. And, and I can see my own pattern of running away. What patterns will you see when you look at your life? How many times have you run away? And the next pictures in my baby book are when I'm with my harp. And that was when I was in high school. It was when I was 16 years old, probably. So often pictures, family pictures will reveal mystery in your life and perhaps even for your children or for your grandchildren. I'm hoping that you won't throw away family pictures because I didn't really get interested in all of understanding legacy until I was in my 70s. And now <laughs> I have devoted the rest of my life to understanding the four acts of life, 25 year cycles. So included in my first 25 years was meeting and falling in love with the person who was the first love of my life. His name was Ron, and he um, was lived in Phoenix, and I, we lived in Phoenix for two or three years, one of the places my mother ran away to. Some of these stories are in my book, some aren't. The book only offers glimpses, and in the last 30 minutes of this call, when you're invited to offer some glimpses of your life, I invite you to do what I've done in my book and often do even on these calls, veil things that I don't want to be too personal about. Veil them so no one will really know what you're talking about as far as specifics. So there's no woundology going on in these calls. These are calls about your significant love stories and how you see through the eyes of love. Once you reach the stage of consciousness where you begin to see through the eyes of the soul, you begin to shift out of the realms of duality that involve judging and good and evil and right and wrong and up and down and all of those kinds of dimensions. And you begin to see vertically instead of horizontally in a time frame. And so it begins to take you into the vastness and beyond the rational mind. One of the ways Ed and I experience that now, and Ed is on the call, I'm glad you stayed instead of going to lunch, Ed. <laughs> Um, we, in the spring and summer, we'll be able to sit out on the patio, the deck of the beautiful home that was a total God job in the fourth act of both of our lives and go into the vastness. It's totally beyond words. It's totally beyond the rational mind. I've learned more things about the clouds and the colors of the sky and the, the, the faces of the wind simply sitting out there on that deck in the evening with Ed, and we are in awe of what that teaches us. So the second act of my life in the pictures that I sent you, age 25 to 50, that took me through my doctoral program and into ministerial school. One of the ways I love to look at life is through finding the humor, not in making fun of other people, or making other people the bunt of humor, as I call that dark humor, but in finding the humor in my own life. This picture is when I was the minister at Unity in Walnut Creek. It's a wonderful picture to me because I think it's one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever used in ministry. <laughs> I absolutely loved the light on my hair and and the pose and all kinds of things about it. What the humor involves is that one of our board members came up to me one day and said, Marge, you really need a good picture. 
I happen to be a photographer and a lot of my work I do for Playboy magazine. I want you to come out in the park with me and bring two or three changes of clothes. Oops, I got nervous about that <laughs> immediately. Bring two or three changes of clothes and let me take pictures of you. Well, thank God I was willing to trust. <laughs> and I got one of the most beautiful pictures that I've ever had taken. And this is when I was in my uh, early 40s. And well, in my 40s, in the second, in, in uh, going to, um, in that realm of between 25 and 50. And so all of these things are things we discover about our sacred love stories. And we can begin to laugh at ourselves. So as in the third act of my life, many things came into my life and that included um uh and this would be age 50 to 75 that included all of the years at unity in tustin this, the, the second act actually included my finishing my doctoral degree at umass a lot of accomplishment Clearly, I was in my achiever stage when I was doing that. And we begin to recognize the own stages of our energy, the own vibration of who we are as a soul. But we progress. We have all of it always already. That's one of the things I love about Ken Wilber's teaching. I am that always already. You are spirit incarnated from the moment you gave we're born. You are that. Are you always aware of that? Nope. There are people on that you probably would point to, especially in this election year, that you don't see much spirit incarnated in. And it's because you have different perspectives, because at different times in your soul's journey, you have different purposes and different perceptions and different belief systems. And so when my brother died, in uh, in that that experience of, of tragedy in my life, uh, one of the things that happened was that I went to Boulder, and I thought I would be there before he'd passed, and he actually passed when I was in the airplane, en route. I had used kinesiology. I had gotten the perfect day for me to arrive. I had some commitments at Unity and Tustin that were really important to me. And the campus of consciousness was uh, in a state of turmoil. And, uh, and I wanted to do everything I could to help it stabilize. After a, a minister's been in a church for 19 years, as I had been, uh, Churches often go through difficult times when a charismatic minister um, resigns and leaves. And that happened uh, in Garth's church, for example. It happened in my church at Unity in Tustin. So in the fourth act, for my 80th birthday, Fabian, who used to have the position that Garth's helping us with now, decided to give me a birthday party, a surprise birthday party. Well, I didn't want to spend my birthday alone or doing something that didn't feel special to me. So I signed up for an intensive at a neighboring church, and it was on mediumship and a very well-known medium from England teaching there. And so I was sitting with someone in a session and that person said, uh, there's a woman in a white dress here and there's a yellow cat standing by her feet. And do you recognize someone that might be in a white dress with a uh, yellow cat? And I thought, well, I'm not sure. It could be my mother, but I didn't have any kind of image 
And when I got back to Unity of Tustin for the surprise birthday party, which Fabian had to tell me about so I could be there for, uh, she had created a video. And in that video was this picture that I don't ever remember seeing before. It has the date 1944 up at the top. And it's a picture of my mother in a nursing uniform. And at her ankles on the front steps of my childhood home is that yellow cat that was my cat in my childhood, a cat that I loved a whole lot. And clearly, this picture, I had no idea would come back into my life in my 80s. So I invite you to consider every stage of your life, whether you're in it yet or not, as one of potential. In my third act, the campus of consciousness was birthed, unity of Tustin. And in this picture, which was the fuzzy one, Marla called it, <laughs> uh, it was the first Easter back in the sanctuary. We had to have three services. We didn't have enough room to seat everyone. We had over 300 people attending on Sundays. And it was packed. And that's, I'm in that picture on the far right. And uh, right in the center of the picture, you can see, if you recognize him, and most of you won't, the face of Tom Zender. He attended Unity of Tustin. Your role in your life is partly to inspire people, to guide them as you are guided by spirit. And I got a, 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 an email or a letter from Connie Fillmore saying she was retiring and they were going to hire their first non-Unity family member as a, a, the CEO of Unity Village. And did any of the ministers in the field have suggestions? If so, would I let them know, or any minister let them know about this letter that she was sending? And I called and emailed it, sent it to Tom Zender. He was a regular attendee of all of my classes, very committed to a mystical journey, an amazing leader with big business background. And this is a picture of uh, Tom Zender and I when he was became the CEO of Unity Village, Unity uh, at Unity Village. And it's the educational platform. It's the prayer platform. It's the publishing platform of Unity. It's not World Unity Worldwide Ministries. That is the church platform. And they are still, even now, are sometimes at loggerheads with each other. So it's fascinating. Four acts of our lives, 1 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 and beyond. So what I look at as I'm looking at my screen and, and the people in the gallery view, if I switch down to that, and I only see a few of them, but uh, I can see Ross, he's in his third act now, uh, going into his 70s, five more years before he's going to hit his fourth act. So Ed's in his fifth, fourth act because Ed is two or three years younger, two and a half years younger than me. I'm still living with the lover who I've known for over 50 years. We get along better as lovers than friends. I mean, then as a partner, as marriage partners. So, uh, you know, I can look at um, uh, Lee, Lee, I don't even know your age, but it's fascinating. You could think about where you are. <laughs> well, are you in the third act or the fourth act of life? Are you 70 or 75? <laughs> I was supposed to be 70, 
three, so I'm in the third act. You're okay. in the third act also. And what I know is I am loving life more than I have uh, as much. More than is the wrong wrong way to say it. More miracles have come into my life, or as many miracles have come into my life uh, as in any other time of my life. I can see the imprints that go through all of the uh, times of my life. And one of my ministers now is my inbox on Facebook. <laughs> I mean, uh, on, on my computer and looking at emails. And just this morning, Diana Wentworth pasted, posted something on uh, a TED Talk. Jody Wellman was the person's name. And titled, How Death Can Bring You Back to Life. And it had 1.3 million viewers. <laughs> wow. Wow, yeah. My brother's death in Boulder, Colorado, brought me back to life. And Ross wouldn't be part of my life. I, I knew Ross and Mary before. On we were on Carrie O'Fallon's calls together. Ross and I were even in a sem, um, a live intensive in San Diego together. But we never had a private conversation. And now I consider them my most trusted companions in Boulder, and they're helping me in ways I couldn't have ever handled things on my own relative to the apartment house that my brother lived in for many years and, and that I am now uh, the sole owner of for the rest of my life. And, um, but it's complicated. So that's not exactly true. And I'm not gonna go into, there's, there's an example of veiling complications. And I want you to understand how complications can be veiled in your life too. And Ross, I'm going to go back to you and let you direct me. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Well, one of the things uh, that I've I've just observed, Marge, when we were talking about the four acts, um, one of the things that I've observed and sometimes teach is um, about how the soul or the psyche is constructed. Okay. And we can see it in terms of maybe four walls of a narrative that kind of create the stage that we're on. The stage one that you're talking about, um, one way that that could be stated as a story is that it's a legacy narrative. And we all have a legacy narrative that uh, we come into with years growing up in Boulder, Colorado, mine in a small town in Illinois, with the parents that we had, with the teaching that we had, you were a Seventh-day Adventist, kind of a fundamentalist religious organization and all of that. You wouldn't have imagined that from that sort of a background, you would become a kind of a global leader and touchstone for progressive spirituality. But nonetheless, it was deep in there. And it it learning the Bible and learning all that sort, sort of things, I'm sure proved really useful to you. So there's an there's a there's a first act which is the legacy narrative and many of us of course struggle with our legacy narr narrative we struggle struggle with it mightily especially if there's trauma or there's there's something that we don't want to have but there's something in our soul's journey that's given in that legacy narrative that we both have to adopt and also have to reject in order to get to uh, fully into the next stage this, the second stage that you talked about is um, kind of our conformist or our social narrative. It's um, also the achiever narrative. The achiever narrative. In, your, in my case, I went to law school, got a family, found a career, found my niche in it, got competent in it. Um, you uh, got a went out and were, were one of the you know few kind of wayshore women that went out and got a PhD on her own and and uh, and it's the, uh, the the achiever narrative that is kind of defined by the social expectations of the culture in which we emerge. So it's a cultural narrative that we conform to in some ways, and then also try to find our place within. And it's really important to find our place within that cultural narrative because we live in that culture and it has to sustain us. That's act number two. 
Act number three in the other wall of the personal narrative comes when we can begin to have the force and power, if we've done act one and two uh, well enough, to begin to uh, choose how we are seen, okay? Which is, <laughs> which it, it uh, like Michelle Obama said, if you don't choose how you're going to be seen and tell people who you are, they're going to fill it in for you. OK, they're going to they're going to put their own narrative on top of you. And, and so choosing how to be seen in your case as a as a minister and as a vessel for the Holy Spirit is, co is something completely different than the professional narrative would ever give to you. So it's a it's a choice. And now in the fourth act, uh, the, uh, up comes the other kind of wall, all of which all these narratives are running at the same time throughout life, uh, where there's a possibility of. Uh, receiving uh, an interior narrative, something new that is coming from some sort of other place other than the legacy, the society, how we're seen by others, uh, that that begins to interpenetrate. And since you are in the fourth act and well into it right now, I'm wondering if you could maybe get into how uh, the interior and the multidimensional reality and the seeing through the veils is now occurring in your life and how that is now creating you and helping you discover uh, and operationalize your soul's purpose. It's been an amazing journey, especially since my brother's death, catapulting me into life in a new way. <laughs> um, I had known that I was probably going to move somewhere. I thought about Boulder. I thought about Oregon. Uh, I could have stayed in Southern California. I owned a house there that was paid for, so uh, I could afford <laughs> to live there. However, when my brother died, Ed was the one that called me and said, Marge, it's time for you to move back to Kansas City. And when he describes it, uh, he said it was like something just like a light came and hit me. And I called you and said, it's time to move back to Kansas City. Now, we had known each other for 50 years. We had visited back and forth. We had had a passionate love affair in our 30s and, uh, and then... I took off and went to New York and Massachusetts and did my doctoral degree at UMass, education, doctorate of EDD, actually, in Ross, and I, a very avant-garde program and experiential uh, learning, and uh, uh, Gene Houston called it the best in the world. <laughs> Buckminster Fuller was uh, adjunct faculty, and um, and I didn't know any of these pieces as destiny path then. I just was following my heart, just following my heart. And Ed said, I invited him to come with me. And I, uh, he said, I'm just a Midwestern boy, <laughs> Kansas City boy. <laughs> and and so we both went, at, went forward into very, successful lives in different directions. What I didn't know, and this was amazing, is that he would have soul wounds in those apart years, even though we visit each other, usually at least once or, once or twice a year when I came in for ministers meetings, um, and I had soul wounds. And we didn't know each other's soul wounds. And then when we decided to come back together in our 80s to complete an unfinished love story, all of a sudden we're hitting the wall sometimes <laughs> with what I finally figured out were soul wounds. And it didn't have anything to do with each other. It had to do with some of the propensities and perspectives that each of us had adopted in our quite different lives, both very good lives. He was a better parent than I consider myself to have been. 
I was a really, really spiritual person in my success story at, at Unity of Tustin. It was a campus of consciousness that uh, was just incredible. And yet it was different. And I need these kinds of calls. I need everyone that's on this call. I need the people in my life now who speak a mystical language. People in Kansas City don't speak it in the same way as the people I hung out with at Unity Intestine in my classes or the people that I hung out with in Called by Love in the events that we did, um, re live retreats and live classes and uh, and all kinds of things. What I know is that part of me dies if I don't continue to feed and nurture that part of who I am. And I've got 15 more years to go in this fourth act of my life. And I fully intend, if spirit wills it, to live it at its full potential of beauty and amazing gifts. And this incredible home that came into our lives, not because I chose it, it was Ed that saw it, because he knew a realtor that heard about it, and it had showed him some other houses because we were talking about buying a house. And all of a sudden, we have this incredible place that would be ideal for weekend retreats, <laughs> for small groups. Kansas City, the ideal setting for a retreat center at Unity Village. Kansas City, Unity on the Plaza, the ideal ministry that has two services going simultaneously, one a Buddhist service and one a, a Unity service mainline unity, normative unity, more than mystical unity, but one of their ministers integrates all of it, as I tried to do it every Sunday at Unity and Tustin. Synchronicities happening. Holly is the miracle manifestation of a synchronistic event. And no one I, Ed and I, neither one even knew that Briarcliff West existed. And you have to begin to recognize the way that spirit is directing you, the way that you are called to go beyond anything you've ever understood with your human mind, because it's going to obliterate the levels of human awareness where you uh, saw judgment and where you saw the dualities of life. And they're still happening in Kansas City. It's not that Kansas City is immune. We just had a tragic shooting after a Super Bowl win. And uh, amazing, life happens. So how will we choose to view it? Through the lens of the soul, through the lens of spirit, David Hawkins is still one of my greatest teachers. I just read uh, The Ego is Not Your Real Self. Right. It's so amazing. Mark, yeah. It's, no, I, I don't mean to, to interrupt you, but there's just a point here that I think it might be really um, helpful when we're talking about how we choose to see things. Yes. It's been said that uh, everything happens twice, right? Once when we experience it and the second time when we interpret it. And uh, the development of the habit of interpretation of events as part of um, the curiosity that we have about the unfolding of our soul is a beautiful attribute to begin to develop, especially through things that are that look difficult or that are looking like a block or because it opens it up to both uh, to interpreting those things as what the soul needs in order for its growth and development. And this switches the topic just a little bit, but one of the things we wanted to cover and that you've touched on a couple of times are the, the idea of holy wounds. 
um, divine wounds. And you mentioned that what you were doing was following your heart. Oftentimes, I certainly in my own personal case, and with many, many people that I've spoken to, when you follow your heart, you oftentimes are walking into a holy wound <laughs> to, a, to a heart break because there is, you know, love involves that. It, 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 it involves that. It involves an opening up of the self and an exposure to, you know, the possibility of being wounded and not being sit, sitting in some tight little thing. And uh, that's, that's a way of opening to the mystery that also opens up to the synchronicities and the possibilities and the new changes. So um, maybe you could talk just a little bit about, you know, if you can do so without revealing too much about holy wounds and and how they've come into your life and how you've been able to both reinterpret them and use them to uh, manifest your soul's purpose and to help it on its journey. Well, the first holy wound in my life clearly was the death of my father at age 11. And... I I had no idea of the kinds of things that I'm aware of now of life after life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not part of the Adventist framework. And, uh, you know, to <laughs> from dust to dust is their framework. And um, and it, I I was ignorant of what was possible beyond and it wasn't my fault. It was the way the imprint of my childhood. And what I know is that life is still happening. My father came to me as I was sitting, <laughs> getting dressed in the walk-in closet in our bedroom here. And... Uh, I have his picture up on the shelf now as a result of that. I was sitting on the piano bench I used to sit on as a child when I learned how to play the piano. And he came to me and said, bring my picture up here. I want you to see me when you sit on that bench. <laughs> and there's the humor, you know, I want you to see me when you sit on that bench. <laughs> and so I see him every single day sitting there now in my 80s and feel the love, feel the love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and another example of that is that kind of synchronicity, things we couldn't even imagine. Um, uh, when I was in ministerial school, I knew how I was called by God and signed up. That's another story also of being called by God. And I had, uh, I, I knew I was called by God and, and yet I, I was feeling drawn to learn more about churches. I was feeling drawn to learn more about amazing ministry. I was offered three different jobs. And one of them was with Jack Boland in Warren, Michigan, one of the largest unity churches in the country. One of them was with Robert Hudson in Texas. Uh, and he was uh, a person that was a dear, dear friend. And, and we used to talk often. And Ed knows him also. And um and all of a sudden, I am be feeling drawn to go to Unity of Walnut Creek before I was even able to apply for churches. Just feeling drawn. And Paul and I, my then husband at that time, he's dead now, um, were having dinner. And it was we were en route to a lecture on synchronicity by Gene Sonoda Bowden and Aunt Bolin. And, um, and we went to the lecture and I was fascinated with it. I went home and uh, after the conversation in the restaurant with Paul and he said, what, what are you intending to do when you graduate? And I said, I'm feeling drawn to Walnut Creek. The minister there had just been murdered. Something wow. totally unexpected. And and I was feeling drawn to learn more about her 
She was one of the most well-known mystical ministers in the unity movement. She was known as a mystic. And I didn't know what mysticism was. And I was feeling drawn there. I, we, I went home and went upstairs after Paul dropped me off to go to his own apartment. And, and uh, the light was blinking on my answering machine. And I answered, uh, I listened to the playback of the call. And it said, hi, Marge. This is Rosie Kimberly. And I'm the board president at Unity in Walnut Creek. We've heard about you. And we would like to have you come and speak. And how did that happen? I didn't contact them. How did that happen? I predicted it because I was drawn. Something in my heart was drawing me to it. And actually, and we're talking to a speaker that's a potential that I've somehow had glimpses of doing a retreat at Unity Village with you and he and I, Ross, and mm -hmm. you know who I'm talking about. We won't announce it yet today because it's not solid and it's not confirmed. <laughs> the, we are, we get glimpses. We don't know how it happens, but we, something in us is pulling us into something that is beyond what our human rational mind can even know. It's our soul that is showing us the soul is an individualized aspect of spirit. Every single one of us on this call and on everyone that will listen to this call in the future and everyone on this earth has an individualized soul. It's not that some of us are privileged and others aren't. We all have individualized souls. Some of us are more aware of the consciousness that's coming through the individualized souls than others. And yet, Romans 8, 28, here's the Bible coming in. I love the Bible. And we know that all things work together for good for those who are called by God according to God's purpose. All things work together for good. I know that promise of that verse, Romans 8, 28, has been actively involved in my life for all of my life. Through all of the tragedy, through all of the sorrow, through all of the unexpected events, everything. And I know it will continue with me for as long as I am in this body. And thank God, uh, I still feel like this body is looking pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Mark, I answer, you, Ross. <laughs> you, you, did. You, you, you did. So um, as we're talking about that particular theme, you know, this runs through the entirety of the mystical literature that there is a call okay there's a, a call that happens uh oftentimes it's an interior sense of knowing or that i've i've got to go to california or i've got to you know i've i've, I've been called you know numerous times to the wilderness to come to come to boulder to what i'm doing now with humanity's team and other there, there's an interior call that just says yes yeah, this is a yes so that's the first thing second thing is you got to say yes to the call because we do have free will and and you can resist it and procrastinate on it for years and years and years <laughs> in my own case just say no not now <laughs> it's just and that's okay not now is an, an okay answer but it, it will tend to come back later and then all the literature basically just says okay once there you've said yes okay now you're in a new situation and usually there it involves now a 
a purification of yourself or a soul of your soul to get ready for this. You got to, you got to drop some of the addictions. You got to drop some of the mental patterns that you had before, and then also develop the new capacities for this new phase of the, of uh, the soul's journey that will, when it reaches completion, um, be part of a commonality, which we used to call God's, plan okay now we're calling it the field or uh the you know next level of evolution or something like that but there's um there's an a, a strange attractor that basically says that there's a place that is more coherent than the one that you are in right now and that we're in collectively and those calls that we can trust usually get us to that greater form of of coherence so I just want to say it's a privilege to know you, Marge, because you are, you know, coherent and, and, and increasingly becoming so as we um, as as we as we go down this path. So, um, yeah, the the call and the and the answer and and also the wound that oftentimes will happen when we respond to the call, which is a, a necessary part of it. Um, yes. Yeah, it's just an observation that. Um, you know, we're not alone in this and we all have very similar things that are happening to us and we think that they're personal, but they're not. <laughs> we're all part of, of, of one being and all going through very, very similar uh, sorts of things. So we have um, about seven or eight minutes, Marge. Is there any kind of closing story or thought before we open it up to the audience and 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 hear some of their stories and questions. Well, what I'm beginning to see very, very clearly is that the time of the superstar, the time of the single act player uh, is diminishing and that we are entering a new era. And it's sometimes been called the Aquarian age Although when that song came out, it was ahead of itself. That cosmic age that is occurring now is a shift from the fourth dimension into the fifth dimension. The, they're vibrational fields. The third dimension is the success realm that I lived very successfully <laughs> in my 30s when I got my doctoral de degree from UMass. And it's also uh, has an element of it in, in the campus of consciousness at Unity of Tustin because I learned huge skills that I applied at in spiritual levels. So we bring the best of all of the levels into our lives as we do this ascension of the rainbow. I love to call it dancing all of the colors of the rainbow. There's an ascending path where you start at the beginning of your life and you have an ascending path and then you have the peak of that rainbow and it's like a mountaintop and then there's a descending path. And guess where the pot of gold is? It's at the bottom of the descending path. What I know is I am in the experience of my fourth act, and I have lived the peak of my rainbow. Part of that was Unity of Tustin and the Campus of Consciousness and uh, all of the world-class teachers that came there, often before they were famous, like Adya Shante, Eckhart Tolle, both uh, Jean Houston, she was already famous. But everyone has their wounds and everyone has their tops of the rainbow. Mine wasn't as visible as Eckhart Tolle's or Jean Houston's. I, I tended to be more of an introvert. I still am an introvert. And on a public stage, I would step into, I would breathe in spirit. I would stand at the back of the sanctuary and I would breathe the Holy Spirit and say, speak through me. That's the invocation that we did at the beginning of this call. 
And then we fulfill that vibrational command, that vibrational gift, if we are aligned with the Holy Spirit living in us and through us and as us. This is an interior process, more than an exterior process. It manifests in the world. Uh, and that's Unity's framework, which I absolutely love. Robert Brummett, my meditation teacher, is now um, teaching in the Buddhist Center at Unity on the Plaza. And he defined the difference between Unity and Buddhism. Unity is a creative path. My book is all about that. The seven stages of creation, the seven days of creation, it's called in the first ch chapter of Genesis. You will live every single one of them over and over and over and over in your life. Every single day, you have opportunities to live in a different stages. It'll be up to you. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. And this is Joshua. <laughs> we know a Josh now. Uh, he happens to be my hairdresser. <laughs> And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mm. So it's fascinating. You will choose who you serve. So that that is my deep passion now is inviting people to share their own sacred love stories. And I'm hoping I have got the next two people in mind for the next two months. So we're not going to announce it today because uh, we're still in dialogue. <laughs> and, well, uh, on, on that note, Marge, we're right, right, pretty much right at the top of the hour. And, uh, you know, just to, to wrap that up, the choosing to become a vessel uh, for the divine and the divine will and, you know, God's purpose. Well, um, it, it seems like almost an inevitability that you're going to get there one way or another. You're going to try serving all kinds of other masters <laughs> and just how like how, how much other pain, how much pain do you want to, you know, endure? How, how many other sidetracks you want to go on? And they're pretty much endless. You can go on them for lifetimes after lifetimes. But ultimately, you know, there's, really there's the Bible days. story of the Sadducees and the Pharisees questioning Jesus. They were trying to trip him up. And they wanted to get rid of him because he was attracting too much attention to larger crowds. And they wanted him out of the Jewish scene because he was a Jew. Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Jew. And they wanted him out. And so they, <laughs> the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the highest teachers and the lawyers, <laughs> and it was the lawyer that asked Jesus the question, what is the greatest commandment? And of course, they're referring to the Ten Commandments. And no matter what he said, they had the answers all prepared. They were ready to jump on him. And, and, and he said, love your neighbors as yourself with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your body, your physical self. And love the other as yourself. Love God, love self, and love others. That means everyone on this planet, including the political politicians that you don't like, including the events that you don't like. Is there a way that all of it becomes part of the good unfolding. Great. All right. Well, on that beautiful note, um, let's open up the call now to everybody. Um, uh, there's just for those of you that are maybe new to navigating Zoom on the lower left um, corner, you can unmute yourself. Everybody's muted just so that we don't have a lot of squawks on the thing. Just unmute yourself or you could... Uh, go to the raise hand thing, which is about two thirds of the way down. Just raise your hand and or or with a small group like this, we can just start talking 
or put something in the in the chat. So or does anybody have any thoughts or comments or something that they want to bring um, in, a, a, you know, a story of their own soul's journey? And I saw a question come into the chat. And Garth, you can tell us what that question was. Uh, Michelle asked, uh, can you mention the four stages again? I missed the last two. I got legacy and society. Yeah, well, actually, those are the the first two of a, this is a mental uh, model, Michelle. Um, we're just getting to know each other. You will find out that I love these mental models. <laughs> uh, uh, none of which are, are uh, describe the mystery of reality. It just kind of helps us to, to kind of maybe, uh, they're just maps that kind of help us know that, you know, we're going through kind of the same thing together and kind of where we are at a certain point in time and what we might expect uh, in at a certain point in time, which is what Marge's four stages talk about. You're going to expect something completely different at age 85 than you did at age five. Okay, that we're we're doing we're different. 75. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're doing different things at, at at different times, and so. Just review the four again. Most of us have a have a self or a psyche that's being created, and that particular teaching says, "Hey, there's basically four walls of it that that are uh, that we have. One is the legacy narrative, what we grew up with, and we metabolize that whether we want it or not. We just get it because we're five years old and eight years old. And we're open to the world, and we just absorb it. We have an open mind, and we absorb whatever that legacy narr narrative is as truth." Uh, we're going to believe in Santa Claus when we're three years old because all the pe people are telling us that Santa Claus exists. You know, we're going to we're going to do we're going to we're going to just absorb you know what we have. So that's that's number one. And in Marge's model, that lasts until maybe age twenty five. But if you break it down into seven cycles, it might you might start to begin a different process. Say age fourteen, fifteen where you do a process of individuation and you try to fit in, figure out where in the world do I fit here you know and what am i going to supposed to do you know am i supposed to be a and you have, that's, that's the big inquiry you know who, who you know what are you going to do when you grow up which is of course a question that never gets answered <laughs> this stage is you're always discovering it it doesn't have a fixed uh en ending point but that's the big what am i going to do which means how am i going to fit into a society and social role am i going to be a musician am i going to be a mom am i going to be a professional and then you go out and you get all the things that are necessary that society says is necessary to prepare you for that you go out and you do it and in many many cases you just say oh my god you know after 25 years of this is this it you know when i coach lawyers it just says i i can't believe this is all there is are you kidding me and then well no that isn't all there is not anywhere close to all there is. You're just having the same year of experience over and over and over again because you're you're captive in your own narrative. In your own narrative, right? It's like it, these narratives can uh, become captive narratives, and they can start to hold on to us. We have to break out of them. And then the next kind of uh, you know season would be uh, a, a deliberate um, choosing of how you want to be seen by the world. And you, oftentimes, like when Marge talks about becoming a mystic. That would have been incredibly dangerous for her at age seven. You know, she would that that would have threatened her very existence to be able to do that. But when you have enough kind of power out out there in your own identity, in your own individuation, you could begin to th think about, wow, I could this is just a role. This is just a made up thing. You know, I can be seen in different ways. And you see that now happening all the time. People change their names to be seen in a different way. In Boulder, they're going to have a long Eastern name with a lot of vowel sounds in it to be seen in a different way. They become a yoga teacher. They they take on different um, the roles. They become oftentimes it, oftentimes it becomes more spiritualized and more interiorized and, and just like I wanted to be seen as a writer. Okay, of a mystical novel that didn't fit into any of the previous two narratives. So you begin to kind of choose that. And then all along this whole thing, uh, there is also guidance coming in about what a potential might be, a person might be, a situation might be that will lead you into uh, a soul experience, which is Marge calls synchronicity. Uh, which you also might call responding to the call or just kind of knowing why am I going out to lunch with this person and sharing all my personal secrets with them? 
Well, it's because the soul kind of put you together <laughs> and something, something cool is going to happen as a result of that. Might be a shipwreck, might be something, but it, it, so, so it's talking to you all the time. This larger self that oftentimes will come from, a, if you're a developmentalist, we call it a level of development that we've not yet inhabited. If you're a mystic, you might call it, uh, you know, a, a spiritual dimension or a fifth dimension, you know. So those are the kind of the four walls, um, legacy, the professional one, this this choice of identity, and then this interior um, thing. So just and, to know that, and all of them, okay. all of them can be up leveled. All of them. The the legacy narrative, what, what, how Marge is up leveled her legacy narrative is, is to say, we're all becoming children of God or children of the divine. That's kind of part of the the, the legacy narrative, but that's, you know, that's a completely different uh, narrative, you know, legacy that we're given this gift, you know, of life to become part of the part of the whole, part of the one. That's a different way of reframing the legacy narrative, for example. And you're not required to go into the vibrational realms that you're not attracted to. And uh, you may get hit over the head by a two before a few times, <laughs> but there's it is always free will, free will. It is a choice that choose ye this day whom you will serve. And so uh, you can always make the choice to say yes or to say, ah, oh, forget it. Right. I just like my life the way it is or not. <laughs> So, Michelle, did that answer your question? Why don't you jump on and unmute yourself and see if there's any follow-up that you need on that. Uh, one more time. You you muted and unmuted. There you go. Okay. Yes, it did. Thank you so much. So, Lee has a story to tell. Hi, Lee. Hi. Did that work? Yes, it did. Yes. Okay, good. Well, um, as you were talking, Marge, about the four stages, I, you know, couldn't help but try to figure out how my life fit into that. I'm sure, I'm sure no one else did that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm and, hoping uh, everyone did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, I'd I'd have to tweak things around to make it work, but but the point is, what what got me thinking was that I, my legacy. Um, stage, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, y you know, everything about my life at this age of 73 was begun in at age five or six with an intense mystical experience that I had just out of nowhere. I mean, as a little kid, I, I did what I've later, many, many years, decades later, found out as a classic um uh, witnessing practice, you know, I, I was asking, I, I got curious about what was looking at my hand. I mean, I, we were digging around in the dirt, me and my friend, and I got curious about what was, what was aware. And I try to look back, you know, like a do a 180 inside my head to see what was looking. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have all those words for it, but that's pretty much what it was. And and I just vaulted into this vast space of total, complete consciousness and realized, oh, <laughs> that's what's looking. That's that's who I am. And it was very quick and I was very innocent and it went away quickly. And I was but I was curious about it. Of course, forever, I asked my parents that night, hey, you know how you feel right now? I wanted them to do that because that's how I language it. Do you, do you know how you feel right now? I thought they would look look within and go, oh, yeah. And then I could ask, them, what is all that? But nobody ever got it. <laughs> Every, everybody I said, you know, you know how you feel right now? And they were like, yeah. And I went, no, right now, right now. And they were like, yeah. And I just knew they didn't get it. Anyway, the point is, you know, many years later, first time I ever took LSD, <laughs> in fact, all of that came back. And I realized it had never actually gone away. It had all been just like hovering beneath the surface as I was an adolescent and went through all that painful stuff. So the point is that that experience at five became really a guiding principle of my whole life. 
I still don't know what that was about, really. I mean, I've read everything there is you could read about it, and and it all makes a lot more sense. But but there's this weird part of me that just thinks I'm really not going to understand until I leave this world. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but it just, it, oh. you know, I guess the point is my life didn't really go through. Maybe if I could put it into a pattern, I'd say that it started from the mystical. And over the years, what's dawned on me more and more is that you just need to um, make that real here. And so my life's become more and more grounded and less and less mystical. I don't have those experiences anymore, but of course I've never forgotten them. And that wasn't the only one. There were there were several, but um, I don't know. The minute, the minute you begin to ask for them, Lee, they'll be back showing you. It, the phrase that I use is awareness with a capital A yeah. of awareness with a small a. Right. And they'll show up in ordinary ways. I can think of one that happened that involved you when you were at Unity in Tustin. Mm. I was trying to create collaboration way before it was understood. Mm. Competition was still the model. And you were the artistic director of Orange Coast Magazine. Mm. And mm -hmm. I invited you to a meeting. We were all sitting around a table and, and you suggested <laughs> that as artistic director of Orange Coast Magazine, you had the ability to give nonprofits free space for advertising right. in one of the most prestigious magazines in Orange County, California. This is a big deal. They're one of the wealthiest counties in the country. Yeah. yeah. And you designed the ad and it looked like uh <laughs> where I can't even remember it showed the picture of a whole lot of people who had come as speakers hmm. and where would you be able to see all of these speakers in the same place or something hmm. like that? Hmm. you wrote the copy hmm. and that ad showed up in Orange Coast magazine and all of a sudden our attendance shot up <laughs> yeah. oh. I, I don't know realize. if I even gave you that feedback. You, one of your art pieces is still used on their stationery uh, on the letterhead. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that came from your mystical awareness when you were very young. Well, that is true. I mean, I I know that when you know when I got to college, I started drawing mandalas <laughs> because they just I didn't know what they were, but I was just you know they just kind of came out. I was supposed to be listening to a lecture, but actually I was drawing, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it, it does all fit together. That's for sure. Um, and I guess. To Spirit point, will use it. This is the this is the point. Mm -hmm. Spirit is wanting you, calling you to, so that your gifts of genius can be used for the plan of God or call it the divine plan in your life. Yeah. It's sometimes said that, um, you know, we're, we're walking a crooked road. Okay. Mm. We don't know uh, where we're going and it, you, you only can look back and see the straight and narrow mm. <laughs> that, that, that crooked road. But uh Lee, you and I have a similar thing. My big mystical experience happened to me in my uh, very early 20s, just completely out of the blue, mm. completely on, on, you know, and I wasn't on anything or any, you know, wasn't, didn't have any spiritual practice or anything, but completely out of the blue. It just said, oh, wow, you could see the, you could see, I could see the world this way. Mm. And then, of course, you collapse back into the old way of seeing it, you know, through the separated sense of self. Mm. But it's uh, it's a yeah. You did write a book about that, and I did write a book about wrote it. it as a novel, but much of it is actually your true story. Yeah, you have it on your shelf there, Marge. It's over your shoulder. I know. <laughs> and Teslin on this call helped me so much for that book. Thank you, Tess. <laughs> yeah, shared journey with with that, and yeah. Um, it's also interesting too. This story about something as simple as placing an advertisement. Um, 
Yeah, people come into your your lives and and sometimes just like one little thing like that that you have the power to do, and you do, and you do it, and it and it changes hundreds of people's lives. Mm. You know, putting an ad in a magazine might be a like a five hour job or something like that, designing it and putting it in there, and it 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 changes it changes lives. Yeah, we, and here's the book. Oh, thank you for. Thank you for showing people. Keepers of the Field by Ross Hostetter. <laughs> All right. So anybody else have any thought um, um, or story that they want to share? We're talking, we're in, well, we're in fellow company here in, uh, in, as a group of mystics. We're, we all get the, you know, we've had, almost all of us have had some interpenetration at some particular point in time which is actually quite common. Even statistical studies like the Pew Research says that it's it's as common as the rain. You know, over half the population, two thirds, have some sort of opening or mystical experience. I'd like to say to share, can you hear me? Yeah, you sure can, Tess. <laughs> um, for me, kind of uh, a little bit like Lee's experience um, as a young person, when I was uh, probably around 12, I was just hanging out in my room and just all of a sudden I thought to myself, where did that thought come from? And it was like, it was like a major deal for me to to suddenly realize that, you know, I had an interior and I didn't really know much about it. And, um, and so that what followed that was my trying to track my thoughts, you know, like, well, what was before that one? And what was before that one? And, um, and so that was my first big experience. And then and then that was followed when I was 19 by my my father's death. And I had a very stormy relationship with him in my um in my teens. And so him for him to suddenly die, it, it just sort of like scraped away all this ego story about about being a rebel and not, you know, just being mad at him and everything it was just like whoop, it was gone. And then that, and then what, then at 19, that allowed me to go to California where I had um, my first experiences with LSD. And um, uh, my very first one um, was, uh, it, uh, it literally blew my mind open. And uh, it, it was just kind of like my thought, my first thought after recovering from the first experience was, um, I have no idea who I am or what this is. I have no idea. And it was actually kind of scary for me because I didn't know how I fit in or, or however, I did have a, 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 a group of merry hippies that I was, uh, you know, hold up with there in, in uh, California. It, well, not so much hold up with us, with them, but on the beach a lot with them. <laughs> and, um, and so I felt like I had family at that point because I never felt like I really fit in with my own family. And then, and so then, because I didn't really know about my mind or, or 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 like anything, I felt like I felt like you know my whole life up until that point was just um this just, just a story, a fiction. And so then I started uh, my first big book was uh, Be Here Now, uh, Ram Dass's book, and I, that was like my bible for for a few years. And then I ended up in in uh, anyway. So where do I want to go with this? Um, I think I've always been, um, I can't say that I ever reached any pinnacles of achievement in my life. Um, became a pretty good musician and have um, followed the path of the artist musician. And and I think I spent a lot of time, and I'm still spending a lot of time in in that cave, the cave of the wound, um, still, still trying to claw my way out of that. <laughs> so, um, and just always just really hungering for truth. And, and so I haven't really so much um, belonged to movements or groups for any more than a few years at a time. Um, and then it's time to move on. And so now I'm near the end of my um, third stage. Are we calling them stages? Um, and, uh, I really don't know what's coming next. I really. <laughs> so how old are you? Uh, 73, I think. 73. 
<laughs> at, at the end of the year. Maybe 74. At the end of your third stage, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, th there's a wonderful Ram Dass story. And uh, I, as I was the senior minister of Unity of Tustin and, and called to create a campus of consciousness, which in ministerial school, I'd written that vision as part of my credo. And my teacher said, you know, this is a really good credo, Marge. The only problem is it'll never work. <laughs> and and um, he passed me. He didn't make me rewrite it or anything like that. And then I ended up at Unity of Tustin and created exactly the campus I described in that credo. <laughs> in that credo. And and it worked. And uh, at one time, um, I was a, a person that was on Living Loving Legacy, one of the the, our, the first summit, uh, told me that about Ram Das having his stroke, and that he had given away all of his money in his lifetime, and he just gave it away as fast as it came in, and all of a sudden he's has a stroke and he doesn't have the money to survive. And so this Roger Walsh had been involved in helping do a benefit for him in the northern in Northern California. And um and when I was as senior minister thinking about who to bring to Unity of Tustin, I called Roger, who was a good friend, and said, I would love to do a benefit. 100%, 100% of everything that comes in for Ram Das, we wouldn't take a penny of it. Just 100% would be for Ram Das. And we sold tickets and, uh, and sold out and created overflow space and Ram Das. Um, and <laughs> when... Roger called to ask him. He said, oh, I can't do that. I have aphasia. There's no way I can do public speaking. And I said, let me talk to him. And so I got in touch with him and I said, you know, this community is used to meditating. And it would be just a joy to sit in your presence. And if you go into aphasia, we'll just surf the silence with you. <laughs> And he was intrigued by that idea. Surf the silence with me. I and love he, it. Yes. <laughs> and so he came and we were, took a lot of pictures. Krishna Das came with him and uh, did music. And, and, and it started at nine. It was scheduled to go from seven to nine. The people at Unity and Tustin were used to it ending on time. Starting on time, ending on time. And at nine o'clock came and and some of them left and they some of them had paid big money for some of the front seats <laughs> and 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 so as, as soon as people left the ushers let people in the overflow room which was the children's ministry know that there was there's how many seats were available and they kept the <laughs> sanctuary filled until 11 o'clock <laughs> and nine to 11 people moving in filling up the sanctuary and then Ram Das went over to the children's uh, where the youth ministry meant Victoria House it was called and uh and signed books over there until 1 p.m. <laughs> he was so filled with the energy of spirit just consumed with the fire of spirit. And it was like, of all of the speakers, and we probably brought a, a hundred, hundred and one a month for uh, uh, 10 months out of the year. And of all the speakers, that one just blew the top off of everything because you could feel the vibration of the energy penetrating the entire room did everyone understand it no no one would have left if the people who left at nine o'clock understood what was unfolding 
So maybe some of us don't say yes because we simply don't understand. And we take off and do our own thing because we think a good night's sleep is more important than <laughs> hearing Ram Dass <laughs> surf the silence with him. <laughs> so those are just amazing experiences of how spirit works. And thank you for sharing that in your own life. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I really loved your story about Ram Dass and um, his his movie before he died, Becoming Nobody, was yeah. really, really awesome. <laughs> totally. John Welshens wrote a, a couple of the endorsements on my book, and and um, and he used to travel and see Ram Dass regularly, at least once a year, spend time with him. So the, the, you never know what spirit is going to bring into your life. If you try to plan it, put it on a schedule, it's, that's your human mind doing its human energy stuff. And it can be a higher self that's a, that uh, is your higher ego self. <laughs> but there is a spiritual ego as well as the pure work of spirit moving in you and through you. All right. Well, um, we've just got about three uh, more minutes. Just one observation when you're talking about all the wonderful things that happened in the in California, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. There are places where there is our higher coherence. You know, I think, Tess, you and I moved to Boulder because, of, you know, had the promise of one of those places and has been. And th those places all also go through cycles. Um, they're, they're there for a time and then it, it moves off into another one. And so, um, I'll just close my little prayer for everybody that we find our place, both in our, our own psychics and our own work, in our relationships, in, in the place that we're living. And Marge, you want to just send us off with a little benediction and, uh, anybody else can stay on. I'm going to have to leave because I've got another, um, appointment, but. You, you want to close this? I'll up? stay on as long as anyone would like to share. And so I will stay on uh, for some more minutes if that is, seems appropriate for you. So I simply invoke the Holy Spirit. And I invite you to use this kind of invocation. Invoke the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Fill me, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power. And the words to the promise from A Course in Miracles are words that I have said thousands of times over more than 50 years. Once I have accepted God's plan or the divine plan, once I have accepted God's plan in my, as the one function of my life, the one function that I would fulfill, there will be nothing else that the Holy Spirit will not arrange for me without my effort. The Holy Spirit will go before me, making straight my path, leaving in my way no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar my way. Nothing I need will be denied me, not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before I reach it. I need take thought for nothing, careless of everything, except the only purpose that I would fulfill. And that phrase, careless of everything, used to sort of trip me up sometimes. What does that mean? Take thought for no thing. Careless of everything that you feel attached to with your ego self. If it's dissolving, let it dissolve. Don't attach. If it doesn't feel good to you, let it go. Let it go. 
And I am so grateful for every single one of you on this call. My heart is with you. My prayers are with you. My blessings are with you. And I hope you will make Called by Love part of your life. I hope you'll donate to it. I hope you'll give to it as we relaunch, rebirth, restructure the plan of God and not only the life of Called by Love Institute, but in the life of all of those who choose to be part of it. And so it is. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in a month, if not sooner. Okay. Bye. And I'll stay on. Thank you, Ross. For anyone that wants to stay. And uh, I see Donald. Uh, I see Marla, the call-in user. I'm guessing who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to come on and you can just unmute yourself. Uh, your mute button is down on my screen. It's the lower left. And it says, has mute with an X over it. And if you click on it, it uh, lets you speak. Anyone want to speak? Marge, I just have to say this call has been phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's just wonderful. Absolutely. It's exactly what I needed to hear right now. <laughs> well, you know, often we find that we inspire each other. And that's what's so important. It's like, oh, my God, I could do that. Oh, exactly. my God, I've had those kinds of experiences. Oh, my God. That's telling my story. Yep. And, you know, what's important for me is that we veil anything that we don't want to out on the public record because um, I don't want you to veil anything that you wouldn't say from a platform when, you know, it's like YouTube can be used or Facebook can be used for good or for evil. And we're in a technology age. I want these recordings to survive my physical incarnation. So they will be recordings for posterity. Think what it would have been like if we had, had these kinds of technical tools during the time of Jesus. Oh, wow. <laughs> Many people at Unity and Tustin in, in the days of the first 19 years that I was there, said that they felt the presence of Jesus in that sanctuary and that they literally felt like this was a gathering of souls who had been present at the time of Jesus. I mean, I, I one of my childhood experiences was knowing Jesus loved me and singing Jesus loved me and, and I, you know, learning the, just short little clips out of the Bible that we memorized. And that was all important to me. It's not always important in churches anymore. I think that's sad. It I'm really is. Sorry that that's not still happening. I, I just want to say just how wonderful this call was. And I'm just so happy to be on. <laughs> and just hearing you, Marge, you're just, Oh, I just, I mean, I just missed you so much. So that's all I want to say. <laughs> well, well I want you to know that I had a call with Pam Bozinski this week, and she asked me about you and how you were doing. <laughs> so. Oh, that is so sweet. That is so sweet. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I mean, just listening and everything, I feel like, I almost feel like I could be, we could be back in the sanctuary at, at Unity, but here we are in the wide world web. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, I mean, I just, it, it just was really beautiful. And I just wanted to say also how much I loved the pictures in the email 
I just loved them. Well, I want you to know that I felt, felt so honored uh, because you have been a teacher of mysticism in the uh, spaces in which you inhabit, <laughs> including co-teaching with me sometimes at Unity of Tustin. And um, you are an amazing, amazing soul. And I was so uh, touched, absolutely touched, when you invited me to do your bat mitzvah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, and it was so because incredible. it had been denied you in your own childhood. And you grew up to be a teacher in that same uh, lineage. And yet I was the one that was able to give you that sacred gift and what I believe is that you and I probably shared a past lifetime together and that it was in the Jewish lineage and it had all of the treasures of Judaism that we both love so much. One of those treasures for me is being a harpist. And, you know, David always had the harp. <laughs> the Psalms are written by David. So, and the stories that you have shared um, and the sacred teaching from ancient Judaism and especially, especially the mystical uh, has allowed me to grow spiritually. So thank you. Thank you for being in my life. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know how much it means to me. And just thank you so much. We should teach again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Love you. <laughs> so I love you there. too. Love you more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 and if this is the Donald that I think it is, uh, I want the people on the call to know that this is the person that Michaelia from Vienna talked about when she was on the call last month and that uh, Michaelia and Donald have been in touch weekly, sometimes more than that, as his wife suffered with a stroke. And, and so it was a special, special gift that uh, Donald traveled uh, from Washington State, if it's the same Donald that I'm thinking of, um, to Unity of Tustin uh, when we did some live intensives. Just an amazing gift. You know, it was a destination ministry. People came from all over the world and we would announce speakers and those speakers would attract, they would mail to their audiences and those audiences would be uh, become aware of the high mystical teachings that were happening at this place called Unity of Tustin. It's no longer happening there like that anymore, but it was for that period of time. And people would fly in from Europe and, um, <laughs> uh, and all over the country, sometimes from Canada. And it, it was a destination ministry that was a landing spot for mystics. <laughs> And what I was guided to do was to stop teaching uh, the way I had always taught, which was to try to teach to all levels, normative unity, fundamentalist unity. And I love fundamentalist because I'm the Bible and Jesus are so much a part of my own life. But uh, it, being able to do that uh, to a worldwide audience and having people fly in from everywhere. And I remember Michaelia sending me a video once of when she had been in dialogue with Eckhart Tolle, not realizing, or maybe she did, um, that Eckhart Tolle had come to Unity of Tustin before he was famous. And so it was the birthplace of worldwide fame for some people like Adyashante and Eckhart Tolle was part of that. 
And I will never forget going in up to Eckhart Tolle in the green room, which was in Victoria House, and speaking with him briefly and and giving him a hug. I'm a hugger. <laughs> giving him a hug just before he went over to the sanctuary to go up on the platform and speak. And when I hugged him, literally, his whole chest was vibrating. His heart chakra was just vibrating. And I could feel it pulsing in, through my entire body. So these are great, great gifts of these experiences of connection with spirit. And I'm so grateful that these calls are continuing. And Garth, thank you so much for your role in uh, making this possible. Really, really appreciate you. You're welcome. All right. And so with deep love and deep gratitude for the all that is, knowing that people in the past will hear these recordings, knowing that people in future time will hear these recordings. For one of the things that happens when we are dealing with the shift in consciousness is that you, you go from the linear model into the vertical and you start doing the process of spirit ascending and the soul ascending. And that's happening simultaneously in all of your lives, whether you are aware of it or not. You yeah. sometimes check out before you become aware of it as consciously. I sometimes lose track of it. The minute I begin to feel things like anger or begin to feel even frustration, it's a signal to me, oh my God, come back into alignment, come back into alignment. And one of the great gifts of that book I just mentioned earlier, The Ego is Not the Real Self, is that I know all of the parts that I still live out sometimes, like anger or frustration occasionally, very rarely anger, but frustration still, um, uh, or things like uh, disappointment even. All of the energies below 200 on David Hawkins' scale uh, I find myself, I drop into them and I have to just come back into awareness of the breath, awareness of the breath, God's plan, awareness of committing my one purpose to that plan of God unfolding in me and through me and as me. And I'm looking at the clock and we're almost 15 minutes over time. And thank you, Garth, for staying with us. Thank you for the privilege of being able to teach the highest teachings I know to the people who stay for as long as they stay. And so deep love and deep gratitude.